BGP link state, it is not new. It's been kicking around since, oh, 2015 or so. And on the surface of it, you might think, why? Why are we carrying link state information in BGP? That's not what BGP is for. And yeah, you're not the only one with an automatic reaction like that. But the reality of BGP LS has more nuance to it. We might jokingly call BGP the kitchen sink of routing protocols, but the engineering choices that were made were made for a reason. Remember, everything's a trade-off. To educate us on what BGP LS is and why it exists is Hannes Gredler. He's heavily involved in the deepest corners of the networking industry as a CTO and founder of startup RT Brick, offering cloud native routing software for telcos. And in the past, he has also chaired the IETF ISIS working group and was a distinguished engineer at Juniper Networks. And he holds some routing patents and he's a published author. You get the idea. Hannes knows what's going on when it comes to BGP LS and he volunteered to share some of his time with heavy networking. So Hannes, welcome to the show. And hey man, let's get started by going right to the heart of things. What is BGP LS and what problem does it solve? <laughs> Hi, Ethan. Thanks for the red carpeting, first of all, <laughs> and having me on the show. So, uh, well, BGP LS, uh, uh, probably I should, before we go into what it is, uh, we probably should start uh, uh, how it was conceived, right? It all started uh, with an old acquaintance uh, from Cisco uh, joining uh, Juniper Networks. Uh, you have him, he's a frequent speaker on the show, uh, Dave Ward, right? So mm -hmm. in 2009, Dave Ward with his entourage was coming in. And uh, one of the problems that we had to solve uh, was um, trying to uh, deliver a bit of an application intelligence, right? And uh, expose uh, what we have uh, in the routing daemon, all the link state data, all the uh, internet prefixes, all the internet egress points, and sort of feed that into uh, what was known at that time as an Alto server, uh, which again will sort of aggregate those information together and tell clients like uh, you know BitTorrent <laughs> or whatever content distribution uh, networks, uh, you know what turns, uh, what paths to take, and uh, well, this is how it all started. So I I'll respond with the obvious question, which is. Why didn't you just handle it like a lot of other services have needed to handle that particular problem uh, where they would you know, say it was an OSPF network. You set up an OSPF listener, have it join OSPF and then learn everything that's going on from the IGP that way. There was even a box I ran that wasn't from Cisco, but it ran EIGRP and listened to IRR EIGRP IGP network. Uh, very good question. Um, usually, uh, I would say for uh, the simple uh, labs, like you do your CCIE or whatever vendor certification, this uh, approach would work. But as soon as you uh, try to consolidate uh, uh, views and topologies from network spanning potentially thousands of routers, right? Yeah. Uh, you actually have a practical problem. So you need to backhaul all those topology views using GRE tunnels, whatever. You need to um, actually do this in a redundant fashion. Um, so at some point, you really have trouble scaling the Alto server, right? What is going to be a Linux box with uh, 4,000 GRE outgoing tunnels? And even then, you need <laughs> to actually scale uh, the adjacency machinery on that Alto server uh, for terminating uh, all those 4,000 uh, adjacencies and getting the other side to tell you about his local view of the topology. So those are really some of the practical problems. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing along with you a little bit because I actually faced that challenge in, in, in one of the networks. I mean, it sounded like it was such a simple thing. I'll just stand up an adjacency to your IGP and you're all good. And, and in fact, right, when you get begin operating at scale and you're trying to communicate with all these endpoints, points to get a clear view of the topology, there is a computational problem and logistical problem that you're facing uh, to, to, to deal with that. So right, in a smaller environment, no big deal. In a really big environment with many hundreds or thousands of routers, yeah, big problem. Okay. 
So, so I, I mean, the practical problem was, uh, hey, do we really need to replicate uh, the protocol machinery, right, for both OSPF, for ISIS, uh, for BGP, uh, to, uh, do we really need to replicate that down to the Alto server, right? Or uh, couldn't we just, uh, you know, uh, have a sort of a very unified way uh, of the Alto server learning about the topology, ideally, but just opening uh, a TCP channel somewhere into the network and then really retrieving all that information. That was so it, the whole idea. So the, alt, the point here is the Alto server doesn't need to participate in the routing protocol to be able to discover the topology. As long as you can just give it the topology information in some way, it can figure out what it needs to know to do its job. Exactly, exactly. And this is actually how we started. That was phase one, right? Okay. Uh, so then uh, usually the Alto developers come to you, okay, give us the data. What are your APIs? And big surprise, mm, there are no APIs, right? So uh, probably those guys went back and started to hammer um, the routing subsystem with their SNMP queries, right? Uh, because that at the time, or even XML, <laughs> because that at the time was the only way to get structured data uh, out of the routing daemon, right? Um, and uh, you also see here a little bit the semantics are wrong, right? It's essentially a pull model where you constantly are pulling for information. Has anything new arrived? But uh, what we really wanted to have uh, the Alta server is an accurate, up-to-date view of the network. So we were pretty certain that we wanted to have a push model where the routers, whenever something changes, a new topology, a new link comes up, uh, a new IP prefix uh, is reachable, that uh, uh, 10 milliseconds later, uh, the Alto server knows and can take action. As opposed to polling on an interval to pull that information and being blind for however long the polling interval is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And while we were, um, you know, when we talked here a little bit about the initial use cases for Alto, um, uh, very quickly, uh, as soon as we started talking about it, uh, uh, all the traffic engineering folks jumped onto that and say, hey, oh, by the way, aha, real time uh, topology information across IGP boundaries. I, I, I want that as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I have, uh, you know, RSVP calls, um, really heavy uh, level three, had ver very traffic engineering uh, uh, related problems, and they wanted to uh, really get full visibility into every corner of the network and uh, BGPLS uh, or any sort of topology synchronization protocol should, could exactly just do that. So uh, I think an important point to make here is BGPLS is not BGP as a routing protocol calculating link state and making forwarding decisions. It's used to carry link state information from a different routing protocol but, but again, it is not making forwarding decisions like OSPF would. Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, uh, if you uh, try to compare it, uh, what modern application developer are uh, doing today, you could almost describe it as uh, a message bus for routing topics. Uh, so today, application developers would just, uh, you know, launch up a Kafka instance, uh, uh, publish here of certain channels, uh, and then have their subscribers to subscribe to that channel and get a replica of the data. And uh, essentially, we have bent uh, BGP to just exactly do that. Uh, we had those multi-protocol extensions, so we could actually uh, publish several lanes of information. And hey, well, we did V4, V6, we did... Uh, uh, route target information. Uh, uh, Pedro uh, was even uh, distributing firewall information for mitigating DDoS attacks. Uh, so uh, uh, we were actually very shameless, right? And said, hey, we could just go ahead and, and distribute link state information for that. The vehicle seems to work. It does feel like it's pushing the boundaries a bit where those other things that you mentioned, like, well, V4 and V6's address families, you know, BGP is making uh, routing calculations and forwarding decisions based on that information that's carried in those NLRIs. 
but now, now we've taken it to the point where we're, we're purely at that message bus state. Hey, we've got a bunch of BGP adjacencies. We can use it as a sort of a database to move NLRIs around. So let's do that. BGP itself never makes any calculations, but it's handing off that information that's been carried through it as a message bus to like the Alto server. We haven't mentioned PCE yet, but, uh, but, but I know that's a use case there as well. Um, that's correct. And uh, there is always, I would say, <laughs> since the introduction of multi-protocol BGP uh, uh, 20 years ago, there was always the allegation to say, hey, look, you guys are now really messing up uh, one of the core protocols of the internet. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the sky will be falling ultimately. But let me uh, tell you a thing, right? Uh, Usually, um, there is, in a good modern implementation of a BGP routing protocol, uh, there is a clear separation uh, between the message parser, between the stream parser, and actually the per address family uh, handler of code. So usually what the message parser does, it goes through, uh, parses the message. Uh, if it's uh, just uh, V4 uh, updates, which are typically found at the end of the BGP message, it is going to write it into a dedicated interim table. And uh, uh, so it is also for uh, data uh, and uh, routing and prefix information encapsulated in the multi-protocol uh, reach uh, uh, and unreach path attributes. So there's an interim step where this goes into a dedicated ribbon, into a dedicated database, right? And uh, let me tell you one thing, those stream parsers, they're really hardened, right? Uh, uh, every, uh, I would say, honorable BGB developer, uh, every company who is in this space has really very tight fussing tests. Uh, they're doing, uh, uh, make everything sure that there is no uh, sort of uh, stream corruption or uh, a bug in the parser tearing down everything. The, the point you're making there is the stream parsers are, are, are hardened. And th that means if we keep throwing more different sorts of data streams at BGP, as long as each stream parser is hardened, if something goes wrong within one stream parser, it's not going to just kill the entirety of BGP and cause like, like a neighbor reset or the process to have to reload and, and so on. That, that, that is then, I would say, uh, uh, a question on the implementation. So if both the stream parser and the para address family handler are, uh, let's say, in the same process, in the same Unix process, then obviously, uh, uh, if you have uh, at the more vulnerable code, which is usually the per address family handler, uh, if you have a bug there and run into a crash situation there, then the whole thing is going to tear down everything, right? Uh, uh, so classical mm -hmm. page sharing problem. However, if you have a, a slightly more modern architecture where you have clear process boundaries uh, between the stream parser and the address family handler, uh, then you should be good. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and more modern, certainly that is an architecture that we've seen featured in a, in a, a great number of uh, modern and updated versions of operating systems where the way that the different daemons are stood up and the way that the different processes interact, there's a good deal of isolation and it's much easier to, if there is a problem, just have that one process restart I mean, I would say all the code bases, right, which have been conceived uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, they clearly are in some degree vulnerable to the problem uh, that the BGP critics uh, uh, really uh, uh, put here on. However, um, uh, I would say modern architecture, all the stuff that has been developed in the past five, 10 years uh, actually uh, does not have uh, those kind of vulnerabilities and issues. Uh, so I, I want to go back to something that we opened up and kind of made the argument that BGP LS exists because we wouldn't want some device that's trying to calculate, say, you know, traffic engineering or segment routing through the network to, to have to listen to an IGP itself. We're asking too much of that device to be able to do that, especially in a very large and complex network. So we're just going to carry link state and BGP. I just want to revisit that. Is that Sure, really? Sure, sure. <laughs> really? I mean, do, do we not have enough computing power to pull that off at, at this point where, you know, we, we wouldn't have to rely on BGP to carry the link state for us. We would just use an actual link state protocol as the underlay, just, just leverage that nat native data, if you want to think of it that way. 
Um, <laughs> fair argument. Um, um, let me ask you a question. Uh, I know it's a little bit impolite asking a question with a counter question, but uh, uh, what's your guess? You know, what is the amount of IGP developers that we have on the planet, right, uh, that uh, know how to do uh, a proper IGP state machinery with pacing logic? That is question number one. And question number two, uh, how many application developers do you think there are on the planet who understand how to build an application on top of TCP? Uh, and that is essentially the cornerstone of my argument. Uh, TCP with flow control, uh, resequencing, uh, having this uh, um, semantics of uh, a stream, uh, that actually solves a lot of the problems that usually need to get solved at the IGP transport module. And um, usually that is actually a very hard piece. I mean, I'm pretty sure you have seen Dave Katz's uh, Nanoc presentations and uh, uh, he's preaching to the core <laughs> why link state protocols are hard. And I have to say he's absolutely right. This is- Well, really I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, Wayne. If, if you're in the audience listening to this and you missed that nuance, BGP rides on TCP. It's TCP, uh, TCP 179, right? Isn't that the port number? Uh, that is correct. That is correct. And that uh, design choice takes, uh, takes a great deal of complexity out of the transport module of BGP. We're relying on, on TCP to be the transport layer and to do all of the things that TCP does, um, as opposed to OSPF or EAGRP, which is their own IP protocols. They do not rely on TCP or, or UDP or any other transport layer. They have their own transport functionality built in. So going back to your point, uh, about developers and coders, the if they don't have to worry about the transport stuff because TCP is just there, that's already been written, it handles that for them, you have a, a much greater likelihood of success than people that would have to write um, some kind of a, a parser. You, you talked about message pacing and do all of that kind of stuff uh, that you'd have to do on the IGP side. But 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 still, Hannes, I, I'm still going to kick it back because because open source. Aren't there enough open source flavors of OSPF, let's say, and ISIS to maybe that code exists? I I I I, I actually uh, it's a hobby of mine, right? Uh, I actually check out <laughs> open source code bases, right? Uh, and uh, one of the first things they always have a look at is at the transport module, right? Uh, and the transport module, I usually have got uh, uh, two questions. Uh, first of all is uh, it receiver driven, right? Um, so um, is the uh, flow of information actually re reversed? Receiver driven means the interface says, hey, I'm ready to transmit. Oh, now let's drain uh, 20 link step packets uh, from the flood queue and transmit it there versus um, uh, sort of a naive implementation who always tries to say, okay, I have information to flood. I need to tell it everybody in the network, okay, let's now start filling up queues, right? Uh, the uh, letter is actually leading uh, to a congestion collapse on the load. Hmm. And um, open source, right? I love it, but uh, this is actually the piece uh, uh, that uh, pretty much all the open source implementations of IGPs are really lacking. Uh, the transport module uh, is not receiver driven. The back of heuristics are not really well developed. And that is actually the difference between, uh, you know, what the incumbents are doing and uh, mm. uh, what is out there in the open source world. I got to get you, me and Don Sharp on a, on a, on a podcast conversation just to, just to talk through all this stuff. This would be a, that would be a fun one. Well, okay, Hannes. So we, we, you've, you've, done the work of convincing us that carrying link state in BGP, basically leveraging BGP as a message bus makes architectural sense. The networks that need this are already going to be running BGP. It's there. It's something you can take advantage of. So effectively, it becomes the job of turning on the NLRIs that do this and distributing link state from the appropriate IGP into the BGP process and then carrying those brandy new, all super shiny link state NLRIs. 
Great. We mentioned Alto. We mentioned PCE and passing. Let's get into more detail on these use cases here. Why? Why would I do this? And maybe we should start with uh, with segment routing. Um, when I we talked a lot about segment routing on the show over 2019 and 2020, would you say BGPLS and segment routing are complementary or competing technologies? Uh, I would say uh, to a large degree complementary technologies, although the policy stuff and the egress peer engineering, there is certain overlaps. Uh, uh, but uh, by and large, I would say uh, complementary. BGPLS is uh, just supposed to be uh, that uh, layer that provides really end-to-end -end visibility in otherwise uh, uh, closed uh, topological domains like IGP areas or ASs, even sub-ASs. And uh, uh, sort of uh, BGPLS really provides that full visibility. Mm. I had thought complementary and uh, for, for what you just described. So if I'm building out my hop by hop segment routing, whether that's a stack of MPLS tags or something I'm doing with V6, uh, I could, could potentially, depending on my topology, use the information I gleaned from BGPLS to build that segment routing instruction stack and then send that uh, tagged pack it into the MPLS core and have it go hop by hop based on what it learned from uh, the IGP link state. Does that sound plausible? Absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, one of the ideas and one of the uh, early use cases, and I've mentioned traffic engineering before, uh, was that whole idea of uh, a sort of um, SDN TE controller, right? Uh, which tries to really optimize the utilization of certain egress links or certain core links. Uh, and uh, uh, for that, uh, we wanted, uh, we needed to actually make that whole feedback loop uh, for traffic engineering much tighter. So we needed actually a faster way to ingest uh, traffic statistics. And also, uh, we, uh, again, uh, need the STN controller to understand the topology as a whole, to build models around that, and then sort of uh, uh, distribute uh, to certain ingress routers or uh, core routers, uh, um, you know, sets, uh, stacks of uh, segment routing labels uh, to really ensure that links are not overutilized. Uh, so that was always, uh, I would say, back in 2000. 2013, when we started conceiving the technology, uh, uh, one of the problems that we wanted to solve. Yeah, and that, that's really interesting because uh, routing engineers that aren't in the service provider world maybe don't think in terms of link consumption. What is my current link utilization? Should I be rerouting traffic because this link is being too heavily utilized because they're using an IGP that's a uh, compute shortest path first, and that's all you get. It's all, we can't take link utilization to consideration and then move traffic around. And of course that doesn't work in the service provider world where the links are very expensive and you gotta optimize traffic across each of those very expensive links. So now you're in a situation where based on time of day, traffic flowing between these two routers might be badly congested. And in real time, you wanna adjust for that and move certain flows redirect certain flows uh, into other parts of the network. You can, con so you have to know the topology. So there's BGPLS helping us know the topology in great detail. And then the controller taking that topology information plus traffic statistics, congestion, utilization information, and then being able to, uh, I don't wanna say arbitrarily, but to some degree arbitrarily change how traffic is flowing through that network. Uh, w w one of the asks that we got in 2013 uh, was mostly from uh, the uh, providers, from the network operators who were sourcing uh, a large number uh, of content, right? Um, and uh, basically say, well, look, uh, the majority of um, uh, uh, the products that we are offering uh, by and large are free products, right? Uh, so essentially every dollar that we save on infrastructure uh, is actually profit. 
So uh, normally in enterprise world, uh, you would, um, you know, not saturate the individual link more than 50, 60%. And then you would start thinking about backups or, um, um, you know, uh, circuit upgrades, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, those guys, they really wanted to sweat their assets. They wanted to Mm -hmm. ensure that uh, you can really load it irrespective time of day. You can go up to 90, 95% of link utilization, right? Uh, uh, And you can only do that, uh, uh, certainly not as a human operator, right? Uh, You need an algorithm uh, uh, in a closed feedback loop uh, doing that persistent optimization. It's not really router truck is quickly typing doing that. No, (laughs) no, of course not. (laughs) No, right. So great, great use case for that. Uh, Are there other big use cases we should talk about, Hannes? Um. Uh, one of the things uh, that we also see, uh, so so, so at, at Juniper, uh, we we had uh, obviously a great uh, love for RSVP. Uh, we thought um, it's a, a great mm-hmm. protocol to solve certain problems, right? Uh, especially when it comes down to uh, you know reserving bandwidth along a path. And uh, one of the issues that we saw uh, a bit uh, uh, with um, traffic engineering, especially with the RSVP was really uh, uh, crossing a routing domain or uh, crossing an IGP area because um, the only uh, sort of uh, reporting uh, vehicle to get traffic engineering information uh, back into uh, the uh, traffic engineering database was the IGP. So uh, then uh, as soon as you started to segment uh, your large network consisting of potentially thousands of nodes into smaller areas, uh, you could only uh, compute the constraints that you had for that LSP uh, uh, for uh, the area uh, that you're directly connected with. and um, the, the, the interesting thing was um, actually the whole um, traffic engineering architecture uh, that has been described of, uh, in RC 4655 actually allows uh, in the architectural document to uh, synchronize traffic engineering databases between domains. However, nobody really uh, has ever uh, formalized a synchronization protocol uh, right. to do exactly this. Uh, and I was, I was really going crazy, right? Uh, going to Adrian Farrell and Yakov and say, hey, come on, you know, you've been doing this GMPLS stuff, right? And it's there in the architectural document. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we never had time to do it, right? Uh, so uh, at some point uh, we said, well, could BGP LS fill in that void and actually be that synchronization problem? And then all of a sudden, if you do this, uh, you can actually solve that problem. You really can have end-to-end LSPs. You can have constraints. You can have, um, you know, exclude certain SRLGs, fade sharing stuff. Uh, uh, so all of that starts now falling in place. Hmm. That's a, that's a, I don't know how many people have that exact problem, although that's a really interesting one. But, uh, but yeah, now you've got a means to share that information cross domain. Pretty cool. Anything else we want to talk about on the use case side? No use case, I would say traffic engineering, providing application intelligence, uh, and also I would say uh, uh, building a collector infrastructure. Uh, Because uh, what you can do uh, here is essentially use the um, typically scaling machinery of BGP, which is route reflectors, uh, to uh, actually disseminate uh, the and scale uh, the routing mesh into every corner of the service provider network. So um, that goes back uh, to the initial argument uh, uh, by using BGP, you can just have uh, a single TCP session into the cloud, into the network, uh, rather than having uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, GRE tunnels and still you're able mm-hmm. to obtain uh, the complete topology. Hmm. Well, Hannes, I wanna get a little bit nerdier and deeper at this point by talking about the NR- NLRI and the different types and what those look like. Now, for those of you that have been listening to the conversation thus far, uh, there's a secret. This presentation that you're hearing probably is audio since that's how most of you consume Packet Pushers Heavy Networking. 
Well, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash packet pushers. And this presentation is also there. Hannes has been sharing slides with me the whole time while I've been watching. It's totally like cheating, but you can cheat too. Just go over to your YouTube channel and you can watch this the presentation and recording that uh, that Hannes is doing here as he and I are chatting through this. And I say that because uh, Hannes, I believe you got some slides coming up that are gonna show us some of the NLRIs in, uh, in some detail. Okay. So uh, a little bit of uh, uh, link state theory first, right? Uh, uh, the three elements that really um, all the link state protocols, ISIS and OSBF have in common is uh, essentially uh, links, of course, <laughs> node information, and actually, um, you know, some flavor of IP prefixes attached to those nodes. And voila, those are exactly the free uh, NLRI types uh, that we have in BGP LS, right? Just for a commercial break for you listening to this, if you're, uh, if you know OSPF and do show IP OSPF database, that information that Hannes just talked about, um, what the nodes are, links, and the type of links that they are, and IP reachability information, that is what the IP OSPF database is, in effect, if you can decode what you're looking at there on that screen. For, for, for OSPF, it's a little bit messier even, right? Uh, because OSPF is a messy protocol. There, there's uh, more to it, for sure, yeah. <laughs> so uh, usually when you just watch the router LSA, right, uh, uh, for OSPF, uh, then usually there is a mixture of all those frees, right? Uh, uh, in the router LSA, uh, it says, hey, I am uh, router ID X, so that is node information, right? Mm -hmm. Then it says, uh, hey, uh, I'm having either a point-to-point -point link uh, to the other guy or uh, a link uh, uh, to a thing called a network LSA, right? Uh, which would be link information, right? And then there's stop network information, which uh, would be IP reachability, right? Uh, so in OSPF in the router LSA, you find all three classes of that information. Um, in ISS, it's a bit different, uh, but uh, uh, um, essentially similar. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three components that make up what gets carried in the different BGPLS related NLRIs, right? Yeah, so it is actually fair to say um, uh, uh, the f information that we encode uh, in BGP LS is a sort of a protocol neutral representations of nodes, links, and its attached prefixes. Of course, uh, there is some, uh, I would say, uh, OSPF isms and ISIS isms that sometimes we have to pick up. Uh, but by and large, it's uh, a canonicalized representation of nodes, links, and prefixes. So when, as a BGP receiver of this information, I, I, I get this and I'm, uh, I'm some kind of a controller, I'm not doing OSPF, I'm not an ISIS you know, protocol speaker to be able to interpret that link state information. I just need to know enough to interpret the link state information I've been given and put together a topology together. Maybe I've got some kind of uh, graphing that's going on in my code, something like that. Is that exactly, correct? Exactly, exactly. So uh, essentially you have those three databases, you have the node, you have the link, and you have two prefix databases, one for v4 and one for v6. And um, on all of those database, you have got uh, certain sub attributes. Uh, so for example, what are sub attributes? Uh, let's say when the link is reported, uh, you can um, attach uh, the ID of the remote router, right? Uh, or uh, SRLG group uh, or an IGP metric or a TE metric. So further properties of that link. Similar thing for uh, nodes, right? Node information, you can add capabilities like, uh, you know, segment routing, uh, SRGBs or uh, host names uh, for uh, ease of management, right? Uh, so again, some attributes uh, that goes along uh, into the node database as well. And of course, uh, we have got uh, some sub attributes for prefixes like, uh, you know, metrics, uh, tags, um, you know, uh, internal, external flag bits, things like that. Because it's, okay, that actually is an important point because we talked about topology. It's one thing to put the links and the nodes and the reachability information in there, but it's another when you begin to include metrics. But in fact, that matters because 
if the IGP has converged in a particular way due to those metrics, then that's something that the endpoint that cares about this information would need to understand. Absolutely. I mean, and you really need to understand, uh, let's say, uh, uh, if I'm the traffic engineer and controller, I need to be almost as good as, as my uh, live routing software, uh, such that I'm able to predict what's going to happen. If I realize, let's say, a link has a close to infinite metric, uh, okay, good. Uh, probably not much traffic is going to float uh, uh, over that uh, particular link. I don't know, man. I'm going back now. I'm going back to our earlier conversation. But why don't I just run an IGP? Because we almost are almost. <laughs> well, uh, I would say um, implementation matters. Uh, there is usually uh, two school of thoughts, right? Um, there is one school of thought who says, "Hey, look." Um, in the IGPs, uh, we do not really have very sophisticated transport uh, uh, modules. In fact, uh, uh, we do not really uh, have a way of doing flow control. Mm -hmm. Flow control is essential for scaling, right? Uh, the receiver needs to tell uh, the sender, hey, stop, buddy, right? Uh, I'm already yeah. getting too much information, right? You're overloading me, please slow down. In TCP, that's very simple. Uh, we just don't read the socket, right? Uh, uh, TCP kernel machinery, uh, um, you know, says, hey, uh, the window has been closed. Uh, please don't transmit, right? Uh, very simple way of flow control build, built into the protocol. In the IGP, we don't have such a thing. I know. And we had this we had this part of the conversation before. I don't mean to keep poking you about it. It's just like every time you dig in and you find out really how complicated it is and what's being asked, it's it, somehow my engineering brain keeps going back that way. Wait a minute. Why are we resolving this problem? Didn't we solve this already? I mean, if you want to get uh, your fair dose of reality, right, uh, uh, have a look at the ISIS or LSR uh, uh, working group list in the IDF uh, where people in the past year uh, have been debating exactly about that very same thing, right? Mm. Uh, how to get back, uh, how to get a notion of flow control uh, into uh, uh, the ISIS protocol, right? Uh, uh, and well, <laughs> it was uh, uh, scratching and biting, right? Uh, uh, people could just not really get to consensus uh, uh, what would be the right way of doing it, right? Uh, so those are some of the more practical considerations that I have, right? Uh, versus with TCP, hey, right? well, 20 year old protocol, we you know all the back of mechanisms, dynamics are pretty much understood. Uh, uh, transport problem solved. Very well proven, uh, guaranteed delivery, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, 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 and timeliness, right, in, in the face of congestion. So, yep. well, Hannes, are there things that BGP LS should not do? If people are were, they're, they're hearing this and they're going, oh, I, I got, think I got some things I could do with this, would you, would you warn them away from certain applications? Uh, yes, <laughs> and, uh, we actually had a bit uh, of that conversation, I think, uh, back in uh, on the ITF meeting in 2015 in Berlin, right, uh, where uh, some, some uh, networking engineers jumped up and said, hey, wouldn't it be a cool thing uh, to not just do that uh, 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 protocol learn message exchange machinery, but actually make it a real link state protocol, right? Uh, which is, <laughs> let's automatically discover peers. Uh, uh, let's uh, actually flood, uh, let's build some decent flood machinery into that. Uh, let's do uh, SPF route calculation. Uh, In other uh, words, it's not, route. not BGP as a message bus merely, but now BGP doing full blown SPF stuff. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and um, again, then I'm asking myself, you know, what is again the easier thing to solve, right? Uh, is it uh, uh, now if we add all those flooding and pacing heuristics uh, uh, back into uh, BGPLS, if we add uh, an entire new way uh, of uh, calculating the routes, uh, if we piggyback uh, that on BGP, that would actually mean a ton more of uh, uh, <laughs> handling and address family specific code, right? Well, uh, uh, oh, so much because the core of how BGP does best path calculation is so completely different from what happens in an IGP. You're asking 
you're reinventing the wheel. So, but, but really you end up with two different protocols. You've got BGP as, as we know it, that does for it across the internet and then something else entirely, a whole different address frame that works oh, in a oh. different way. Uh, actually, also the two protocols, right, uh, from most of the implementations that I've seen uh, work fundamentally different. So, for example, in BGP, everything has been really optimized towards incremental updates, right? Uh, uh, so whenever something comes in, right, we uh, run it through the policy and we only uh, process uh, that part uh, that was actually the incremental update. Yep. There is no notion of, um, uh, hey, let's really walk the entire rip up and down and recompute everything. However, if you look at um, the IGPs, right? Uh, after we calculate the graph and figuring out uh, how distant all the other nodes are, then there is the next step, uh, which is loading uh, IP prefixes uh, on top of those nodes. And that is pretty much a brute force operation, right? Uh, uh, we walk all the nodes, see uh, what prefixes uh, do they originate, uh, put them in a global sort list, uh, and then do a walk, figure out what is the best prefix originator, and then uh, uh, notify our uh, forwarding table about that change. Now, if you would do such a thing uh, uh, on BGP, you would actually combine two very different uh, uh, paradigms here. Right, right, uh, with, with, with the scalability challenges that would come with that. Exactly, exactly. So that's where I said, hey, look, guys, uh, I mean, <laughs> Jan Medved and myself have been crazy enough to conceive the protocol, but uh, this is the line, right? Uh, uh, use it as a topology collector, right? Use it as an information gathering layer, that's fine. Uh, but uh, actually don't use it as a as a protocol doing active uh, computation uh, of routes, right? Uh, uh, that problem already has been solved and there is far better tools than that. And has that argument then been put to rest now? Are we done with that? I mean, BGPLS, as I said at the top of the show, it's got, got some years on it, so. I, I, I think uh, there was uh, actually some, some, some data center operators who were playing a bit with the idea, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, uh, it has never gotten deployed, right? So usually Those the proof data is- center operators just gotta have that BGP. I know, I keep hearing about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you should, usually the, the proof, whether it's a good or stupid idea, is in production. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, okay, so one more question here that, uh, Hannes, I did some homework. I don't even know if you would know this off the top of your head, but what BGP implementations support BGPLS? Do you, do you happen to know? Uh, I, I have a small list if you don't have that information at the top of your head. Um, uh, I, I have to say uh, pretty much uh, uh, all the early interop testing uh, we did um, uh, against Cisco, right, uh, uh, which were only uh, uh, at the time the only quote on crazy enough to follow us on that path, right? Uh, so there was only Juno's uh, 14 something, uh, and I think uh, uh, also uh, uh, 2014 release of iOS 6R. Um, who did support that. But uh, uh, after that, I have not really kept track. Well, here's what I found just uh, doing some internet searching. I found Cisco IOS XE as of 16.4.1's got a, a flavor of BGPLS and then iOS okay. XR since 5.2.2. So that, that's quite, quite a ways back there. Uh, Juno's 14.2. So again, right, as you were saying, quite a ways uh, back there. Um, free range routing. Um, that is reportedly in progress, what I found on their GitHub nice, page nice. as of the 23rd of November, 2020 is when I pulled that information. Uh, Onos, which is a, an SDN controller, that project was, it said it was listed as, uh, BGPLS was listed as an active project for Onos as of 10 October, 2020, but I think there's active code that's been working for quite a while. There's a demo of it working in YouTube uh, it's sitting out there on YouTube back in 2015. So, I mean, that that code seems to have been in Onos for quite some time. And reportedly, the Open Daylight controller also can deal with BGPLS. And, you know, thinking about who uses ODL and who uses Onos, that makes sense that BGPLS code would be in there. 
I mean, uh, w w what you have mostly uh, uh, quoting here is actually router implementations, but there is also, I think, uh, a ton of uh, uh, tra traffic engineering controllers, right? Uh, uh, public available or also homegrown ones, right? Uh, I think uh, Juniper Northstar uh, has a BGP LS implementation. Not sure uh, uh, about Cisco Keridan. It wouldn't surprise me if that is in there as well. I didn't. You know, I I did a little digging. I, I only was able to go so far. Uh, another comment, uh, Depantu Shing put on packetpushers.net a summary of BGP LS and how it works. And I believe at the bottom of that article, he'd written some Python that could interpret the BGP LS and LRIs and put a simple graph up on the screen based on the information that he was parsing from the NLRIs, so. It's not that difficult. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things, uh, um, uh, obviously, you know, once you have uh, here a bit of uh, uh, experience in coding a link state database and have a sort of a canonicalized uh, representation, uh, which we did also for RT Brick, uh, uh, one of the uh, functions that, that we have been doing is just uh, plotting here the link state graph, and uh, we just use here a graph with library, right, uh, which has all the primitives there, and they produce really nice rendered outputs, uh, uh, which are really useful for troubleshooting complex graphs. Uh, uh, so um, uh, it, it's not that hard, right? Uh, think about it. Uh, BGP, just open TCP session port 179, do an open message, tell about, uh, uh, hey, I only want to speak BGP LS, right? Uh, send a keep alive, and then just wait for the update stream coming in. That's it, right? It uh, uh, doesn't get simpler than that. Uh, you can do that in uh, five, 600 lines of code. Just five, 600. Yeah. <laughs> Which for people that are new to code, you're like, that's very it's intimidating, not, honest. <laughs> not, it's not much, sorry. <laughs> no, it, it isn't, in, in all fairness. It, 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 programming is like any other task. You just break down compartmentally what you're trying to do and then go get those tasks done one at a time. And and yeah, you're right. There are, there's so many libraries that handle so much of that for you. It's not, not overly complica complex to get something like that done. Well, Hannes Gredler, thank you very much for joining us on Heavy Networking today. And you're a book author and various other things. So man, tell, tell the world how they can follow you, read your stuff, anything you would like to share. Uh, well, um, if you uh, want to reach out, uh, please free uh, to do so. I'm on Twitter, Hannes Gredlar, um, also on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> in my professional life, I'm the CTO of a startup. Uh, we're doing, uh, as you can imagine, routing and BNG software for the next generation central office. If you're interested in that, uh, please send me a DM. Excellent. And uh, you have a book out there, The Complete ISIS Routing Protocol. I noticed linked in our show notes here. How, when did you, you publish that one? Oh, that's an old one. <laughs> that's uh, uh, actually, I, I think uh, this was in the early days of Juniper, uh, 2002 or 2003. Uh, where uh, we wanted to, uh, um, you know, since everything was uh, written with Cisco CLI, uh, mm. uh, we wanted also to uh, uh, get some literature out there uh, uh, how um, you know our implementations work. And um, at the time, uh, I was a professional services engineer and doing a whole lot of teaching, right? Uh, and I figured out uh, that <laughs> a whole lot of the teaching and slide material uh, was not really adequate and uh, causing more question marks <laughs> about people's head <laughs> than providing sound explanations. So uh, after some time, I was doing my own uh, uh, little illustrations and slides and uh, tested it. Uh, if uh, the question marks did go away. And uh, ultimately, I had really a nice flowing deck. And then um, uh, one of the uh, instructors um, uh, said, hey, you know, talk to Walter, right? Uh, you should really, uh, Walter Goralski, which was later on my co-author for the book, uh, you should really uh, write a book out of this. And uh, uh, we did this in just three months. So... <laughs> And oh, uh, totally uh, there's been essentially an ISIS course covering a bit oh. of uh, Cisco and Juniper at the time. I co-authored a book with Russ uh, White, and I'll tell you, it, Russ wrote most of that book, but the, I, I contributed seven chapters or something. 
it was not three months for me to get that work done. Writing a book is hard. So props to you. Well, 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 Walter, Walter, Walter has been cruel to me, right? Uh, uh, he has been an absolutely slave driver, right? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> he just said, hey, look, honest, you get it uh, in time, right? Uh, provide me the content, right? Uh, 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 just uh, illustrations, high level description. I'll make it good. <laughs> so and wow, that's what okay. he did. <laughs> that's, that's perfect if you can get someone like that. Wow, wow. Well, honest again, Again, thank you for joining us in heavy networking today. And uh, if you're listening to this and you want to see some of the slides that Hannah shared as we were talking, go to youtube.com slash packet pushers and just search for Hannah Scredler, search for BGPLS, and this video should come up and uh, ha have a watch, uh, see what's there and help visualize some of this. If you're new to BGPLS and trying to get some of it into your brain, these slides are quite detailed and informative and should help put some of the pieces together for you. If you like this kind of content, you're a network engineer, you're trying to educate yourself, keep up with what's going on in the industry. Well, we have many more of our fine free technical podcasts, plus our community blog. That is all at packetpushers.net. We're on Twitter. If you want to follow us, we're at Packet Pushers, and we're also on LinkedIn. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.